you all hear me? Great. Well, welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. Thank you very much for being here this evening. We missed you all last month, uh, but we thought it was going to pour and we would have to swim here, so we decided not, not to uh, have a lecture. Um, thank you again for being here. I would like to, first, before we get started, we, you know, every, every week we have a, some housekeeping. Your hair is awesome. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Sarah got a haircut. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I would like to introduce a couple of people. Um, and you all, a lot of familiar faces, but we have some familiar faces, some new faces here tonight, and I'd like to introduce uh, Emma Sunderberg, who's uh, standing right back here, who is our new education and outreach coordinator, and today is her first day. Oh, wow. We're very excited to have her here. And Carrie Brown is next to her. She, Carrie's been here um, just a month, but gosh, we don't want to let her go. We're going to lock the door. She is our intern that was sponsored by Shell this year, and we are thrilled. We're already like signed her up for the next internship last for next year, um, and that's been very exciting. And I think everyone knows Lucia here, who's our business manager, and and uh, she takes care of everything. And Erica is around here somewhere. Erica is back there, and Erica, I guess, oh, she'll be here for next lecture. But at the end of August, she leaves to go to Harvard to continue her but only for a little while and then she's gonna come back. So anyhow, um, that's that's everyone here. And you all know me, I'm Leslie. So um, housekeeping, sign-in sheet, as you all know, we have, we need a pen, I think. Um, we, uh, this is for our accreditation, so if you would mind signing, putting your name and how you found out, just information so that we can kind of keep track of all of that. Let's see, a couple of things we have. As you know, if you're not a member, oops, if you're not a member, we'd love for you to join. This is a membership form. We have some at the door. Um, this is how we keep the door open and, and present programs and do all sorts of things. So if you are not a member or if you know someone that should be a member, take one and give it to them and force them to do it. Um, we also have just a couple of things, but we have a new brochure also about the museum. This is about this museum. So if you take the brochure and the membership form and give it to one of your friends, that'll help. Um, but please pick one up on your way out. Um, we have on your chairs, I think you all have the flyer about our kids' summer camp, which is coming up. And uh, this is something that Carrie put together as her program. I mean, she, that's why she was here this summer. And we're going to obviously develop these, and, and um, this will be a big deal, when, obviously, when we move and we have more space. But I think this should be a lot of fun. So if anybody knows, has a grandchild or a child that, thinks would be, that you think would be uh, interested in this, I think they'll have a blast. So please put this on your list. Take the flyer if you know anybody that might be interested. Um, our next lecture, uh, August 11th, is Richard Hall, and he's going to talk about Texas Lighthouses, which should be really fun as well. Um, and I think you have lecture, you have some flyers on that. So instead of keep continuing to talk, I'm going to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Uh, he's not a doctor yet, he's working on it. Mr. Anderson, Professor Anderson, Brian Anderson, he's working on this. PhD though, um, is the author of the book, The Titanic, uh, in print and on screen. Uh, he's a professor of English at College of the Mainland in Texas City and uh, has a UTEP and you have an MA from University of Houston, Clear Lake. So we have uh, a treat in for us tonight. We're going to talk about, or he's going to talk about how the myth of the Titanic uh, was born and all of the things that impact print, film, uh, poetry, you name it. And so um, he's going to eloquently tell us about it as opposed to my telling me, telling you about him. So please welcome Brian Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. It's a great museum. I'm glad to be here. Um, so it should be obvious from my, from the title of my presentation, hopefully, and some of the introductory remarks there, but just to give you a couple of uh, disclaimers, as it were, to start with, that um, I'm primarily going to be talking about the cultural and literary history of the Titanic. I'm not a maritime expert uh, as such, although I've picked up quite a bit studying this, uh, and would be happy to answer any, any general questions you have. Um, but what I've looked at uh, in, in doing my research is the way the, Titan the Titanic has been 
told and retold as a story and reimagined in different ways and um, different media. Um, in my work as a college instructor, I like to look at different uh, incidents in history, things like the Salem witch trials and the story of Pocahontas and how these stories have been reworked and retold in different ways, often really distorting the facts of the history in ways that some would find sort of offensive. But if you look at it from another angle, uh, it's, well, why are they distorting it in this way? And why are they emphasizing certain things about this particular incident that may or may not have happened? So it's those distortions that I'm interested in, how we make stories our own uh, through a kind of myth-making process. Uh, and we, we tell these stories again and again in different ways. We make them our own. We look at uh, the Titanic disaster from different perspectives, uh, emphasizing different things and fictionalizing certain things. And we make it a story for our own purposes. So we're always kind of telling the same stories over and over again, but in different ways. I want to begin with a reading from a book by Lawrence, Lawrence Beasley. Lawrence Beasley was a, a second class passenger, uh, a science teacher who wrote a very well regarded account uh, as a survivor of the Titanic. And I like him because he's a school teacher, uh, but he also was a really lively writer and really captured something important about this disaster through that first person uh, perspective. Uh, and doing it in an elegant way with his language. So this is from Lawrence Beasley's account. We waited, we waited head on for the wave which we thought might come, the wave we had heard so much of from the crew and which they said had been known to travel for miles and it never came. But although the Titanic left us no such legacy of a wave as she went to the bottom she left us something we would willingly forget forever, something which it is well not to let the imagination dwell on. The cries of many hundreds of our fellow passengers struggling in the ice cold water. The cries which were loud and numerous at first died away gradually one by one, but the night was clear, frosty and still. The water smooth and the sounds must have carried on its level surface, free from any obstruction for miles, certainly much farther from the ship than we were situated. I think the last of them must have been heard nearly 40 minutes after the Titanic sank. Life belts would keep the survivors afloat for hours, but the cold water was what stopped the cries. So that's from 19, uh, 1912, he wrote this almost immediately, uh, and really captured that human aspect of the disaster, you know, one of the things that we uh, have focused on a lot is studying the technical aspects of the disaster and sort of, you know, looking at the causes of what made it sink and uh, how it could have been avoided and so forth. But Beasley very early on uh, captures this very human aspect of the disaster. Uh, so, Again and again, we're seeing this resurgence in interest in the Titanic. It's never really gone away, uh, but certainly at the 100 year anniversary a few years ago, we saw a big resurgence in interest uh, a few years ago with the big, the big uh, blockbuster film, of course, there was that resurgence in interest. Uh, I wanna start with, of course, another disclaimer that uh, we're looking at a lot of the cultural and literary legacies here in my, in my talk, and and examining how this story, uh, real life story, has been reimagined in different ways. But I do want to keep in mind that in the background we have a very real disaster with a very real human cause. And I don't want to forget that because some of the things I'm going to be looking at are kind of irreverent uh, ways that the Titanic has been uh, reimagined or appropriated for different purposes. Uh, I don't want to lose sight of you know, the reverence that we can have for this loss of human life, uh, even though we're examining some of the things that have been done to distort this wreck or to use it for even comical purposes. Uh, where does that impulse come from? 
So I don't want to give the impression that I'm being irreverent. I'm just looking at certain irreverent sort of uh, interpretations or appropriations. This is a famous quote uh, from the <coughs> Irish philosopher Jack Foster. We are all passengers on the Titanic. Very resonant quote that gets across this, uh, you know, disaster as a uh, something that is important to all humans for various reasons and that resonates with us in a way uh, continues to capture our interest for a reason. Uh, it's a story of human suffering and a tragedy of the technological age. Uh, how are we all passengers on the Titanic? Uh, it's made an impression on us and an impression on history and we continue to collectively grieve and wonder about this disaster. We're moved by the deaths of innocent passengers and we shudder at the losses and the sense of guilt felt by the survivors. So the Titanic is a kind of uh, ship of humanity that floats on in the imagination and we're forever kind of thinking about that, uh, sinking and grieving at our own mistakes, our own failings, so it's a uh, metaphor for the human condition, if you will, that's one way that it's been looked at it again and again. We wonder what we might have done to prevent this disaster, what might have been done to save more. Uh, we wonder what we might have done in a situation like that. Uh, these are just a few of the aspects that continue to capture our interest. This is a picture of how the Titanic looked in history. Stately, grand, a wonder of maritime architecture. Some called it the ship of dreams because of its luxurious appointments, unrivaled size, magnificent appearance. That's the Titanic in real life. This is how the Titanic looks in our nightmares, in our imagination. This is how she haunts us. This is how she lives on in our collective memory, always sinking, a ship frozen at the intersection of fate and circumstance. An unsinkable ship that was somehow doomed to sink anyway. These voices forever lingering over the water, haunting survivors and all of humanity. The voices that Lawrence Beasley talked about, I wrote about. Uh, the disaster, here's a, a, just a few basic facts to keep in mind. I wanted to, you know, preface this with a reminder that we're talking about a very real human tragedy. Uh, more than 1,500 perished, of course, and just over 700 survivors. We think of the Titanic as a uh, sort of a model of Edwardian chivalry. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, the idea that uh, men and, and, I'm sorry, women and children first on the lifeboats, and that was the rule to see and all that. Uh, there were quite a few women and children who perished, uh, and of course this was a function mostly of class, so something that we don't uh, tend to focus on very much. So the Titanic has shown up in some unexpected places over the hundred years since the sinking. Uh, we've seen it as a source of humor. Here's an edition of the online uh, satirical magazine, The Onion. World's largest metaphor hits iceberg. So the, the kind of the idea that immediately people knew this this ship was a uh, a metaphor, and that the legacy of the Titanic would overshadow the real facts of the, of the disaster. In some ways, that that happened. I'm going to get to that. We've also seen the Titanic in tabloid magazines or tabloid newspapers. There's a headline: uh, Titanic baby found alive in uh, in the ocean cartoons everybody get that one I, you know there's a lot of irreverence surrounding this disaster because once something gets old enough I guess you know it becomes a uh, fair game I don't know 
and a black, uh, a famous blockbuster movie that you may remember. I don't know, it was pretty big, right? 97. Even in camp songs, uh, there's a few folk songs that have that were inspired by the Titanic. This is one I remember from my childhood, going to camp and singing, sing along. Uh, it was sad, so sad. It was sad, too bad. It was sad when the great ship went down to the bottom of the sea. I don't know if you remember that one. Husbands and wives, little children lost their lives. It was sad when the great ship went down. We sang this at camp and I just thought it was a cool song, funny song. Didn't think about the real tragedy behind this song. It just seemed like just something you sang at camp. Titanic had already become this kind of cartoon in our in our minds, you know, just something that you sing about at camp. It didn't seem odd to me at all that we were singing this in this kind of real uh, fun way or being, you know, humorous about it. You can even rent the Titanic for children's birthday parties. This is one of those uh, one of those slides, you know, you blow up and rent. This was really big after the movie, right? People want to, you know, kids kids love that movie. They wanted to have a party with that Titanic theme. I think that would, you know, not be a great idea. But there you have it. We've also seen Titanic referenced in language. This is a very interesting way that the Titanic has entered our culture is through our language and our metaphors and the way that we talk about things uh, in very casual ways. We might say, this is a very common one, like uh, it's like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, you know, when something's a futile kind of effort. Or we say, uh, the difference between this place and the Titanic is the Titanic had a band. You know, that's one uh, kind of a jokey thing. We heard one on TV the other day about Enron, which is local, you know. They said, hey, at least when the Titanic went down, the lights were still on. <laughs> you know, Enron, you know. Uh, so that was the, the metaphor being used there to, to try to uh, explain something. So the Titanic is into our language, and you hear these references all the time. Another one I heard uh, one time is, hey, yes, Bob, your yacht looks very nice, but that's what they said about the Titanic. So uh, what's so fascinating about the Titanic? Why has it been uh, reimagined in all these ways? And I'm going to get to some of the books later, uh, but, you know, through movies and through uh, jokes and songs and uh, language. I would suggest that there are uh, many reasons why this disaster continues to fascinate us, resonate with us, and the historical reality is part of that. People are fascinated by the history of it. They study that. Uh, kids get interested in that part of it when they check out books from the library and uh, you can go to the exhibit uh, when it comes around, you know, the, uh, the artifacts from the uh, ocean floor. Uh, but there are other things that continue to fascinate us, uh, a confluence of facts, myth, and faith. We consider it to be the symbolic end to the Gilded Age, um, a period of economic boom, growth and development in the United States and Britain, the Industrial Age, uh, a time when anything seemed possible and when we thought the growth would never end. It sounds familiar, right? Think about Enron again and the bubbles that humanity keeps going through. Titanic was a technological symbol of what we were capable of achieving and it seemed that we were moving toward this perfect world and this was the perfect ship to get us there. Titanic was also of course a British ship uh, owned by Americans uh, sort of and uh, built in Ireland so it had this kind of you know way of connecting the old world to the new and literally that's what it did sailing across the Atlantic right. Uh, the world changes more distinctly with World War I, but this was sort of the beginning, this omen that things were not as uh, easy as they seemed. There's the uh, 
breathtaking irony, of course, right, that the Titanic, supposedly unsinkable ship, sinks on its maiden voyage. Largest and most luxurious ship ever at that point. You can see this, that's a neat kind of diagram showing the Titanic, uh, taller than various buildings when it's put on end. The Titanic was never uh, advertised as unsinkable, by the way, but that's something, a word that was associated with it, used in articles, and uh, certainly people believed that it was unsinkable. One reason they didn't have enough lifeboats on board. Titanic was a symbolic representation of man's hubris, kind of thinking we could get away with anything, right? Uh, and what happens when we put too much faith in technology? <coughs> <coughs> you see a lot of comparisons uh, when things like the Challenger, you know, disaster happens. You know, again, like, are we, are we too comfortable with our technology? Do we get too uh, complacent? The Titanic was also a microcosm of Edwardian society, uh, cross-section of different classes and cultures. Three distinct classes, of course, plus the crew. Don't forget about the crew, that's a big segment of who was on the ship. Uh, they're the service class. And we have passengers, especially in third class, from all over the place, uh, including Norway, Sweden, Syria, Argentina, Austria, China, India, Japan, Mexico, South Africa, Turkey, and Thailand. So there was this kind of, again, a ship of humanity, a doomed ark sailing toward the modern age. That cartoon intersected the ark and Titanic. Uh, that's not the only time that's been done. There's also the running joke of uh, the Titanic was built by professionals, you know. Uh, but uh, that that's not by accident, I think, that you know, these two ships represent the kind of that ship of humanity again. There were there were lots of ethnicities and you know that weren't represented on the ship, but that's just one way that we think of it. Here's a just a brief chart by the way to looking at the different classes and who was saved and how that kind of divided up. You can see for uh, third class men, you know, the chances were pretty dismal. Uh, and first class men was a little better, but still you know, men in general, as, as we kind of think about this disaster, uh, are not going to have a great chance. At, you know, and that's how it was according to the mores of that time. Uh, it'd be nice if they had enough lifeboats for everybody, first of all, right? So we wouldn't have to, have to uh, live by that. But you do see the, the number of women in third class who were lost and, and the children. Also, uh, a little note down there that 212 out of the 885 crew members were saved, and that's because they had to help with the lifeboats and take on those leadership positions. We're also interested in the Titanic because of the luxury of the ship and the inherent uh, drama that this situation presents. The uh, romance of Edwardian manners that I mentioned, and the, the perception that this was a religious kind of a, uh, incident, you know, that had religious connotations, that it was something that was preordained by fate, all these kinds of ideas that we think about again and again. You know, was Titanic destined to happen? I'm going to come back to that. But we're also interested in the, the what ifs of the disaster. We kind of play these scenarios over and over again. You know, what if uh, they had hit the iceberg dead on? What if they hadn't been traveling so fast? What if there had been enough lifeboats? What if the Californian had come? This is the famous mystery ship that supposedly was uh, within closer distance and could have helped to rescue more people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, the lore and some of the things that have been inspired by Titanic 
uh, a little bit more directly some some examples these are just a few highlights and examples that I find to be interesting and uh, there's lots more of course uh, that I touch on in my book and that have been explored elsewhere Titanic lore begins in some ways before the ship is even built uh, there's a famous book called Futility that was published in 1898 so 14 years before the Titanic and it's a science fiction novel about the uh, sinking of a ship called the Titan and it's 800 feet long very close to Titanic uh, and it hits an iceberg on its maiden voyage and sinks. Well, that's the plot of this novel. Very close, of course, to the actual fact of the disaster. Also, it didn't have enough lifeboats on board in the world. <laughs> so people look at this and they say, wow, that's like, especially Edwardians were very interested in this kind of thing, the supernatural and, uh, you know, did Morgan Robertson predict the Titanic? You know, did he have a, uh, uh, some kind of, extrasensory perception or something like that. Uh, my own thought is no. I tend to be skeptical, skeptical about that sort of thing. But I think like most good science fiction writers, he saw where the technology was going. He saw that this was a likely outcome at some point if they continued to build ships the way that they were doing. Uh, so he was a very uh, perceptive writer, I think. Interesting coincidence, though. Uh, also, the news immediately starts to perpetuate myth over reality. News gathering, of course, not as advanced as it is now. One of their early headlines, all passengers rescued. Wishful thinking playing out of the newspapers, right? They would, they would hope that that's, what, that's what's going to happen when you have a ship that's advanced on the White Star Line going down. In terms of film, which is uh, something that I think we're really interested in as, as a modern audiences, um, there's been at least 15 narrative films, and by that I mean fictional films. Earliest film was in 1912, right after the disaster, silent movie. Most recent one was in 2012, 100 year anniversary. So they just never stopped making movies about the Titanic. Uh, also about 50 documentaries. They keep reconfiguring the documentaries in different ways, the footage, you can, I mean, just endless on Discovery Channel, things like that, the way they keep repackaging this and looking at it from different ways, at different angles, you know. People are, uh, it's like Shark Week, you know, people just never lose interest in Titanic. Uh, so they can just put on another documentary about it. So this is the, uh, the first film called Saved from the Titanic, starred Dorothy Gibson, and she was a survivor on the Titanic. So she decided, I'm gonna, I'm gonna survive and I'm gonna make a movie about it. Uh, she made it a month, was released a month after Titanic, uh, on the anniversary actually, one month anniversary. She was, uh, the story that she's wearing her same clothes in the movie that she wore on Titanic. I don't know if that's true or not, that's one of the claims. And uh, this film is lost, as a lot of films from this time period uh, are. You know, they just didn't think to preserve them, and there was, you know, the problems with the film stock and things like that. Another really interesting example of a early film is from 1943 called Titanic, uh, made by the Nazis, part of the Nazi propaganda machine, and it it made Titanic into uh, a disaster of the capitalist system. This is what happens when capitalism, American style, British style capitalism runs them up. Yeah. yeah. It was never released, was it? Well, it was released, it wasn't released in Germany at the time because they thought it was too scary for a German, that would, you know, it would get people too excited, uh, too upset. They did release it in France, oddly enough, at the time. Uh, and then uh, it is available. You know, it's been circulated on videotape for years, and you can find it on YouTube or whatever, I'm sure. But you can see uh, Captain Smith kind of given that uh, devilish beard, and he's kind of portrayed as the, the, uh, 
the, the bad guy in this scenario, right? He drives the ship into the iceberg because he's he's full of ego and he's full of uh, you know just ambition. So this is really the first time they kind of ignored a lot of the facts and said we're going to use Titanic for our own purposes. And that's what I'm talking about when I when I say Titanic myth making, using the Titanic for your own purposes really begins with uh, I think begins with this. This movie, the uh, German Nazi propaganda film. Another uh, interesting example: the first Hollywood, Hollywood, full Hollywood treatment, really, is in 1953, called Titanic. Again, they weren't real imaginative with these titles, were they? <laughs> uh, this was on TV today, uh, earlier today on uh, TNT or something like that. We watched a little bit of it, you know, and it's kind of corny. It's the same thing that James Cameron did later. They've got love stories and they've got family dramas, all fictionalized, set against the backdrop of the Titanic. A lot of uh, Titanic aficionados, people really interested in the history of it, say, you can't do that. You know, you can't put fictional stuff on the Titanic. That's not respectful. That's not, uh, that's not right. I say it's interesting, you know, because it tells me that the Titanic is a great uh, backdrop for drama, and the history still exists. You know, you can ignore the movies if you want to, um, but it really shows this fascination with the Titanic as a as a backdrop and its potential for romance and drama. Uh, you know, it's kind of inherent in that. Robert Wagner's in it too, by the way. He's still around, so he does a song and dance number, you know, music, <laughs> musical numbers on the Titanic. It's sort of ridiculous, you know, but it's it's humorous in a way. Around the same time with *The Night to Remember*, this is a British film, and they took it much more seriously. The historical aficionados they love this film. They think this is great. You know, they call it a docudrama. They consider it to be so accurate in portraying the facts of the disaster. The other one mentions some of the people that were on board. It, you know, kind of gives a nod to the facts, but mostly it's just Hollywood glamour and kind of uh, that kind of stuff, frothy sort of soap opera stuff. Then, of course, there's a 1997 film, uh, which a lot of people reviled in terms of how it treated the history. I think, uh, again, it's interesting that it was so popular, you know. Uh, this was one of the biggest movies ever. People obviously interested in the Titanic. Not just the love story, but this love story set on the Titanic. They, uh, they did get a number of the facts right for the first time, including the idea that the ship uh, breaks in half as it sinks to the bottom. They had all the historical, uh, the underwater footage at this point. They had more facts and information to make this film a little bit more accurate in terms of that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's not for everybody. I can understand that. Some people see the love story and they say, oh, that's just, that's just corny or trivial and it's just being made for, you know, teenagers or whatever. Uh, but it really says something again about Titanic's ability to plug into our sense of romance and our need for adventure and those kinds of things. There's lots of parody of this movie, by the way, that's come out as a result. A lot of times, uh, the movie was so big, I had a student one time tell me, I'm interested in Titanic, but not the movie. I'm interested in the, like she had to make that distinction, like you're interested in Titanic, the movie, or you're interested in Titanic, the disaster, uh, the history. So it, it's eclipsed it in a lot of ways. When people talk about Titanic, oh, you mean the movie, no, you know, the, no, the real thing, you know, so that kind of, it's really entered our, uh, our language and our, you know, things that we reference. Also around the same time was a Broadway musical. In American history, we know things have gone overboard when you get a Broadway musical out of something, <laughs> right? That's when you know things, are, they've just gone haywire, it's ridiculous. Uh, it's, I saw this Broadway musical in New York at the time, 
pretty neat musical in terms of the effects. The ship on stage, miniaturized ship on stage, had some funny moments, uh, comedy, song and dance, but also some serious moments, some poignant moments, uh, you know, involving the Strausses and things like that. So I want to talk, uh, in, in my discussion with a look at the literary legacy of the Titanic, specifically uh, the books and novels and poetry, I'm going to close with an uh, examination of some of the poetry, at least 58 novels and short stories. Uh, it's been a lot, uh, particularly of interest to science fiction and romance authors, I think for obvious reasons, as a, as a setting, as a backdrop. Uh, children's books, plays, poems, and folk song. The folk song history is particularly interested if you, you know, wanna, if you ever want to look into that. Um, the books started being published immediately, nonfiction books, uh, but also uh, first person accounts, Some of the covers of the uh, novels that have come out over the years, romance novels, science fiction, Starship Titanic, Raids the Titanic, which is about the search for the wreck before they found it. So there was a lot of speculation and interest in that uh, before Bob Ballard discovered the wreck. Children's books. Which I was, they're the coloring book. Right, Titanic coloring book. I, I gave some friends a Titanic children's book, and they they were like horrified, like, oh my God, you're gonna give my kids nightmares, you know. But a lot of kids are interested in this, you know, <laughs> you know, for for their own reasons, and that's a valid thing, right? Interested in the history, interested in uh, there's something real about it, you know. That's what they're interested in. So you can. <laughs> We'll get into that. But, oh, there's the cookbook. I, I guess I mentioned that. That's that's pretty crazy, right? Uh, you can cook the meals that they had in first class, I guess, is the idea. This is one of my favorite children's stories called Polar the Titanic Bear. And it was written uh, about a seven-year-old first class passenger named Douglas Spedden. And Douglas uh, survived the crossing. Uh, then died in a car accident two years later. So sort of a tragic story, sad story. And he's the one pictured in that famous photograph, uh, spinning the top on board. Uh, these photographs that were taken by Father Brown, uh, who traveled from Titanic, traveled from England to Ireland before getting off. Uh, his mother wrote this book, and then uh, did, it didn't get published though for many years. Uh, until 2001, I think, actually. So I want to look at, uh, conclude with a look at a couple of poems. And I teach English, so this is something that I've done with, with my students, is looking at how poets have seen the Titanic differently. And these, these two poems are about 70 years apart. Uh, so it's been a source of inspiration for film and for all those other things, but also for serious writers, literary writers. A lot of the poems that have been produced have been of, you know, varying quality. Uh, but there's been some really important poems that came out of this as well. And uh, the first one is by Thomas Hardy, famous English novelist and poet, who lived 1840, 1928. His life spanned the Victorian age, really and beyond, and uh, his poems are seen as kind of dark, but also they have this musical quality to them. He's sort of a, you know, what you might call a, a prototypical Victorian writer, and he looked like it, you know. So this uh, is called Convergence of the Twain, published just uh, a month after the disaster, so he really got to work on this right away. He saw the significance of this as a historical event. In a solitude, the, the poem's divided up by Roman numerals, kind of uh, uh, signifying the hours of the clock, 
it's one way this has been interpreted that this is a, a moment in time as we move through the the last hours of the Titanic. In a solitude of the sea, deep from human vanity, and the pride of life that planned her, stilly couches she, steel chambers, late the pyres of her salamandrin fires, cold currents thrid and turn to rhythmic tidal lyres. Over the mirrors meant to glass the opulent, the sea worm crawls grotesque, slimed, dumb, indifferent, Jewels and joy designed to ravish the sensuous mind lie lightless, all their sparkles bleared and black and blind. Dim mooned eyed fishes near gaze at the gilded gear and query, what does this vain gloriousness down here? Well, why was fashioning this creature of pleading wing, the imminent will that stirs and urges everything, prepared a sinister mate for her so gaily great, a shape of ice, for that time far and associate. And as the smart ship grew in stature, grace and hue, grace and hue, in shadowy silent distance grew the iceberg too. Alien they seemed to be, no mortal eye could see the intimate welding of their later history, or sign that they were bent on past coincident on being anon twin halves of one August event, till the spinner of the years said now, and each one hears, and consummation comes, and jars to hemispheres. Well, it's a very elaborate sort of poem in terms of its language, and you know, the big Victorian words and so forth, Edwardian words, uh, flowery language. But he's talking here about fate, right? And he's talking about the iceberg and the ship were meant to meet, meant to come together. So this is an immediate kind of perception that the Titanic was fated to happen. Uh, interesting that comes so soon after the disaster. He's also, of course, talking about some of this really grotesque imagery here, uh, the sea worm crawling over the wreck of the ship. You know, he had to imagine this ship at the, at the bottom of the ocean it hadn't, of course, been discovered, wouldn't be for 70 years. Some of this imagery really rings true for us. We think about and see the ship at the bottom of the ocean. So we saw this as a waste of all that opulence, the, uh, you know, the wealthy appointments of the ship. He imagined them lying at the bottom of the sea. There's an actual photograph uh, of the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean. And uh, I don't know, uh, I haven't seen recent photography, but they say it's like disappearing very quickly uh, in terms of uh, you know, how long it's gonna be there. This is a more recent poem, 1983, pretty recent. Uh, and it takes a different perspective on this disaster. Who does not love the Titanic? If they sold passage tomorrow for that same crossing, who would not buy? To go down, we all go down mostly, alone, but with crowds of people, friends, servants, well fed with music, with lights. Ah, and the world shocked, mourns as it ought to do, and almost never does. There will be the books and movies to remind our grandchildren who we were, and how we died and, gave, and give them a good crop. Not so bad after all. The cold, water is anesthetic and very quick. The cries on all sides must be a comfort. We all go, only a few first class. So the, you know, you hear the laughter there at the end. He, obviously this is a more modern poem, not as reverent, more satirical, sarcastic, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the language is different. You have some of those line breaks that are kind of strange more of a postmodern poem. He's talking about the, the movies and books that have been made about the Titanic. That's what I've been discussing here tonight, you know, that this is a disaster that leaves an impression on us. And we all sort of want to be on that ship. Every now and then somebody comes out with an idea for building a new Titanic, right? And, and selling tickets. Who would buy a ticket to, to sail on that? You know, 
got a couple of hands there, right? Uh, it might seem like tempting fate, maybe not, not such a great idea, right? And, but every now and then they do this, and they say, hey, let's, let's make a new cruise ship called the Titanic. That's a great idea, right? Let's just put her out there. Uh, make her look just the same, and you know, everything. Tempting fate, yes, but he's kind of talking about that appeal maybe that people uh, naturally have for this disaster, wanting to experience it in some way safely, hopefully, which is why the movies are so popular. Um, so that is all I have for you tonight in terms of my uh, presentation, but I'd be happy to entertain your, your questions uh, or comments or whatever you might have at this time. Thank you very much. Oh, the safety regulations? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, that is something I talk about uh, in another version of this presentation that I do, that the Titanic did have a direct effect on safety regulations and, and how seriously they take the lifeboat drills. I don't know if you've ever taken a cruise, but that's like the one part of the cruise where they treat you like, we're in charge now. We're not bringing you an umbrella drink. Go get your lifeboats. They, they, they take it very seriously, you know, and I think for good reason. They had a talk here uh, a few, couple months ago on the cost of Concordia, right? And, yeah, so this is still uh, a danger of cruise ships. Uh, you know, we tend to imagine this, oh, it's a floating hotel going to uh, Jamaica, you know, but there are real dangers anytime you're at sea and that far away from immediate help. So, that it, and also uh, the ice patrol was a direct result of the Titanic. Uh, the Coast Guard took on that responsibility and began to take that, that surveillance more seriously. Any other questions? Yes, in the back there. I, I just had a, a, a quick comment. We just crossed on the Queen Mary too, and for two right. days they talked about how close we were to where the Titanic went down, oh, right. and <laughs> where the ice was, and where the ice, and how they were shifting the, the route because the southern limit of the ice was moving north. Okay, yeah. And wow. it just seemed strange to me that here we are on a boat and they're talking about a boat that sank. <laughs> yeah, I, I've had friends before, you know, you can lecture on, on cruise ships, on art and culture and things like that for where you're going. And I've had friends say, why don't you do that? Nobody wants to hear about the Titanic on a cruise ship. You know. Come on, you know. At 12 o'clock, the <laughs> captain got on the speaker and told us all about it. Wow. Well, twice in two days. <laughs> yes. It's still being used for humor, too. A number of years ago, I was on a cruise. And the speaker, the guest speaker, was a, a British writer who had written a book about the Titanic and he was doing a lecture and the captain of the ship was sitting in with the uh, with the rest of the passengers on the lecture. It was a small ship right. and it was very rocky and suddenly there was a big wave and somewhere in the kitchen you could hear it just all kinds of glassware and crockery falls and he says well he says I guess we're okay because the captain is still sitting here. Uh, wow. Well, uh, yeah. Did the white star line survive this? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I have that much information on that. Uh, well, it's now, it's now Canard, which is owned by Carnival. Okay, yeah. So there you go. We're still. Uh, uh, yeah, once our merge, it's different how, how cruising is such a different experience now. You know, people did it then to travel. Uh, and to get somewhere, and now we think of it, oh, it's, you know, you're going to go to Cozumel and come back, you know, or whatever, and uh, being on the ship is sort of secondary. I don't know. Uh, other, yeah. Uh, if we consider journals, diaries, uh, no pun intended, uh, did, any, did any survive, or what? Anything written by oh, yeah. passengers? Uh, well, as far as written on the ship, uh, there's not a lot, no, but uh, there were first person accounts written by survivors almost immediately. Uh, Harold Bride, who was one of the wireless operators. Uh, three or four first person accounts uh, written by survivors. So we do have some very good, very good 
first person information from their perspective. You know, they're going Harold Bride was in the wireless room most of the time and then he's mm -hmm. swimming for his life, you know. And he gets on one of the collapsed lifeboats and so uh, we do have some of those accounts for sure. We also have the uh, congressional hearings, uh, the hearings on both sides of the pond and the first person information from those hearings, uh, witnesses that testified. So we have a lot of you know, good information. Uh, a lot of it doesn't fit, which is why we've had a lot of you know, history uh, uh, exa you know, historical examination of this disaster and kind of trying to piece it together. Other questions? Yeah. When do you think the uh, literary fatalism of the period ended? I'm sorry, say it again. I'm so sorry. When do you think the literary fatalism of the period ended? Uh, you mean, if, when people saw this, people saw this as a thing that was fated to have happened, how long did that last? Just in general, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can look at the literary history, and you know, this was a, a time when uh, we see the growth of realism and naturalism, and uh, writers are interested in things like, you know, uh, are you fated into a certain existence based on your birth? And it was all influenced by Darwin and things like that. We tend to look at it now, I think, with a little bit more of a, an objective eye, scientific eye, hopefully. Right, uh, and we say, here's the things that could have been done to avoid it, and we look at the science behind it, and things that, that could have been done uh, better. Um, I don't know if that gets to your question, but yeah, I think you had a question here. But. Yeah, well, speaking of culture, I mean, Molly Brown, why did she become famous? Was it she just one of many survivors? Or? Yeah, well, uh, she had such a big personality, was a big part of it. And very wealthy. Was, very wealthy. She was, uh, you know, knew, she had made her money in her lifetime, so she was different from other first class passengers in that way. She's very American and brat, kind of the stereotype that people have Americans now, right? Sort of like, oh, uh, she's pretty uncouth, and she was a Westerner, you know. Uh, had made her money in the uh, in mining and things like that, you know. So uh, and yeah, you had unsinkable Molly Brown, the musical based on on her life, which includes a segment on the Titanic. She she raised a lot of money for the survivors, the uh, second and third class passengers. She was very wealthy. She kind of guilted, used guilt, had a big sign that posted how much money people were donating. <laughs> yeah. For anyone who's in attendance interested, the museum has an exhibit there and it includes uh, Lloyd's register from shortly thereafter that shows the Titanic as sunk. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific display back here on the Titanic and, and related items. Uh, it's great that this was behind me the whole time, right? <laughs> they couldn't have set that up better. Yeah. Uh, my personal interest really came about um, about the time that the movie was released uh, in 97 I I was like you know really they're making a movie about this again haven't they done this already and I started looking into it just you know like I'm interested in that sort of thing like why do we keep telling the same story over and over again uh, and I started looking at it like wow we've been we've been doing this a lot over the years and and it really just kind of steamrolled from there. And I started collecting books on the on the subject, uh, and that just kind of grew into a book of its own, where I examined uh, these books and films over the years. Yeah. Oh, did, in your research, did you ever come across any sermons that might have been? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, this was a big subject for sermons at the time and for religious writings and, and even some hymns that were written, religious poetry. People that saw, in that case, they're emphasizing the, the hubris aspect of this, that, that they were, uh, you know, uh, tempting God in a way, and this was a sign of that man was not paying enough attention to God, uh, not being reverent enough, you know, that sort of thing. Very Edwardian reaction 
to it, I think. And so again, that's not the kind of thing you would see now necessarily, but in, you'd see it, yeah, it comes off as a little bit more grating now, but at the time it was a very, you know, common reaction, I think, to give it a religious kind of uh, over overhang. Any other questions? I don't know a lot about the the sister ships. Uh, I do know that sometimes the uh, uh, the Titanic and Olympic are confused in photographs because they're so close, and I always have to be real careful of that to get the right photograph. And, uh, but uh, there was also the Britannic, which is a little bit different. I, I was reading that it, it lasted until. <laughs> After World War II, it was used as a hospital ship. Oh, wow, okay, interesting. Uh, there was one in the back, I think. Now, I wonder if the uh, progression of the movies about Titanic are less about the story and more about the imagery. Uh, we're able to present the sinking of a massive ship much better now than 10, 20 years ago and 50 years ago. Yeah, when I, we were watching the 1953 movie this morning, and there's almost nothing about the ship, really. It, it looks like a bunch of Hollywood sets, you know. It's pretty hokey. And they didn't, yeah, they didn't have the ability to do the effects. So when James Cameron did his movie in 97, one of the big driving forces behind that was, one, he had the, the footage from the wreck, and some of that is simulated, but some of it's real in that movie. And uh, also the evolution of effects you know uh that you see in that movie uh it's, a, it's one of the first big films to really use cgi and you can look at it now and say well it looks so great now but uh back then it was like amazing you know it was amazing when it came out so definitely that drives a lot of it okay i think my my time is up but thanks again for coming and uh please support the event. Thank you very much for being here, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.